Okay, uh, I'm not with the Mohawk Council of Wakazaski. Uh, I used to be a chief, elected chief of the Mohawk Council, <coughs> but I'm no longer with them. I'm, I'm not the director of the Lenapahun Cultural Center. They didn't even give me an interview for that job. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm a museum coordinator there, and I do cultural presentations. Uh, some of you may have seen me all over the Adirondacks, uh, Lake Champlain area, doing presentations. And uh, I am from Akwazasne. I live about 30 feet from the St. Lawrence River. It's not my summer home, it's my year-round home. I, I'm right there in the river, watching everything that happens, planning my day by the way the waves look when I get up in the morning. My bedroom overlooks, it's beautiful, beautiful. It's just the greatest place on earth to live. Now, you talk, when, when I hear the technical stuff about the pollution, uh, it, it kind of blows me away sometimes, because to me, all I see is that beautiful, shiny blue mass outside my window. It's always been beautiful to me. Uh, we're a river-based people. Uh, water is uh, such a big part of our cultural world, and so that's what I'm going to kind of talk about uh, a little bit beyond the science, but more about uh, how that river has impacted our lives and the way we've developed over the centuries, going back long before Europeans ever came here. Now, there was a slide that Jessica showed you, and I want to thank Jessica for all the work she's done for our people. It's, it's amazing to have uh, people that really just dig into the, the, the science of it for our benefit to help us out. She showed a slide of the creation story. Now, uh, in our creation story, I'll just give you the, the, the TV Guide version of it. It's, it speaks of a time when the whole world was water. There were no land masses. There were fur-bearing animals and birds and fish, turtles, but there were no continents as we know it. This is from our, our old tales. And uh, we, we honor that, that ancient primordial world of water by uh, relating some of our culture and the teachings the creation story specifically, but uh, the thing that we record our history on is wampum. And uh, that's what I do is I go around and use wampum belts and wampum strings to uh, talk about our history and our culture. And I got some, some authentic wampum beads to show you today. This is from the Quahog shell, which you only find on the coast, uh, the Atlantic seaboard. And the tribes there made beads and pendants and little lobbers out of this. Uh, Quahog shell, and um, this became a, a, the commodity. It was, they call it Indian money, but it was really uh, a lot more than just money. It was uh, a ritualized uh, a commodity that was traded between nations, and uh, the, the tribes on the coast had so much of it they could decorate themselves with it. Armbands, wristbands, headbands, even whole outfits made of this wonderful bead. Uh, our people living way inland uh, had to reserve it for special purposes like uh, condolence strings that are used in ceremonies when we raise up a chief to take the place of a chief who has passed away we, we do a whole ritual with wampum strings and uh, people wonder why is that particular shell so important to our people it's because it comes from the sea it evokes that ancient time before skyward came from sky world and uh, transformed the face of the earth by bringing continents into being. And so we evoke that uh, mystical world of the sea by taking uh, the shells and turning them into beads and working that into our cultural world. So it keeps us connected to that ancient uh, earth that had no land to speak of. And so whenever we would uh, uh, hold a council, a political council between our nations and other tribes, or European powers, as we would begin every one of those meetings with what they call a small condolence ceremony, where they would uh, hold up the string of, of uh, wampum and they would wipe the tears of the visitors to say, uh, in life there's all kinds of grief and sorrow and pain and suffering. Well, we wipe your tears so that you can see that there's a new day dawning, there's going to be sunlight, the, the, the clouds will be dispersed, our grief will leave us in time. And so we bring everybody together to, to uh, share that uh, enlightening them. Uh, another string that we hold up is uh, we um, unstop your ears. Uh, when 
children are crying because they can't hear you talk to them and you get clogged up. And so we open your ears so that you can hear the birds singing again, you can hear children laughing, and uh, you'll know that life goes on in spite of the grief that we suffer at this time. And then the third string is like a, a drink of cool spring water to clear your throat to allow you to speak so that when it's your turn, you can get up and share your story or your message, sing your songs, and join in. And, and through that process, you see that life goes on. So what it is, is when we would begin a council, we would heal everybody of their grief. Sometimes the meetings were about war and uh, coming to a peaceful resolution. So we had to bury the bones of the dead by covering it with that sacred wampum. So uh, water has a, a big role to play in uh, our, our uh, ritualized manner of conducting diplomacy. So, um, and the belts themselves. Now if you ever have the fortune to come to a Haudenosaunee community, you will see a flag flying over a lot of our public buildings and schools and uh, the, the flag takes this form and this is the original uh, design for our Haudenosaunee flag. It's a wampum belt. Can you all see that okay? I meant to be taller today. <laughs> and it's a chain. And this, is, this probably originates from the colonial era when we didn't have chains before Europeans got here. So we, we borrowed that metaphor to show that the original Haudenosaunee nations, the five nations, the Iroquois, were united and by a chain, like a links of a chain. And uh, you could lay that right over a map of New York State and it roughly corresponds to our original ancestral territory. South of the Adirondacks, over here in the east, are the Mohawks, the Ganyankahaga, people of the Flint. To the west of them are the Oneidas, the people of the Standing Stone. In the center, at the Tree of Peace, is the Onondaga people, the people of the hills. Further west, at the Finger Lakes area, Cayuga Lake, were the Cayuga Nation, people of the Big Pipe, or the Big Swamp, people with multiple translations to their names, I wish they'd make up their minds. <laughs> <laughs> the Senecas on the far end, uh, the people of the, of the Great Mountain, and they were considered the keepers of the Western Door, because our symbol for ourselves, our name for ourselves, Haudenosaunee, or Haudenosaunee, is, it translates as people of the Longhouse. We're considered one great lodge, one big family, and the longhouses in the old days had only a door on the ends. And so the end of the longhouse was the Senecas, and over in the east were the Mohawks. So uh, everybody else is contained within that. And so that's the, probably the most famous wampum belt that you'll ever see. And uh, this is a reproduction of the original. Um, the, word, the Mohawk word for wampum belt is gahyoni. And that word means when you take it apart, when the linguists sit there and chop it up and analyze every sound and syllable in it, it basically translates into uh, a river made by the hand of man. A man-made river. And most wampum belts, am I supposed to excuse myself after that? <laughs> <laughs> most, most wampum belts are long and river-like. And uh, this one, a lot of our diplomacy, the symbols that you see in wampum belts, relate to water. Uh, when colonists began to make their way into our country, coming up the Hudson River, coming down up the St. Lawrence River, whatever, whatever way they got here, it was by water. And some of the symbolism and metaphors that you see woven into belts relates to this maritime traffic that we were receiving. This belt is called the Covenant Chain of Peace and Friendship. And it begins with uh, the, the Dutch coming up to about as far as Albany and meeting our people entering into trade. And they tied their ship to the shore with a rope. This is the metaphor that they, we talk about when we refer to this initial contact. But as time went by, the rope began to rot and the tree got hit by lightning and fell over. That's no good. So they replaced the rope with an iron chain and wrapped it around a rock. But the, the chain began to rust, and so they replaced the iron chain with a silver chain and tied it around a mountain. And all that is is a, is a demonstration of how the, the relationship is evolving. They're starting with simple trade, but eventually they're getting into more of a covenant, an alliance, and the trade <coughs> are increasing. So you're going from rope to iron chain to silver chain, 
the relationship is getting more and more uh, inter, uh, interlocked. And so there's a change in our, our lifestyle, our manner of living is evolving. And also it's, it's not just a one-way street, it's a two-way street. The European colonists are also being changed by their interaction with our people. The, the way you eat, the way you uh, hunt is influenced by what you're learning from our people in the, in the old colonial days. Now in this initial contact, um, that metaphor of the, the, the boat tied to the shore, well, we talk about another belt, and if you're ever fortunate enough to hear some of our speakers, the traditional speakers always evoke this belt, it's called the two row wampum, digany deohate, digany meaning two, deohate meaning two paths. And uh, this also relates to the water. The oral tradition behind this belt says that this is the river of life. Like, as I said, Gahyoni, the word for wampum belt, is a man-made river. So this is the river of life. And when the Europeans came, they were in their boat. And then they gave us that metaphor. But then the, the chiefs stood up and they said, we also have a vessel, the, the elm bark canoe or the birch bark canoe, the dugout canoe. And we sail side by side down the river of life next to your ship. And uh, as long as you don't tell us how to steer our vessel, we won't tell you how to steer your vessel. <laughs> it's a non-interference agreement in its basic nature. Uh, we have our own laws, our own religion, our own beliefs, our own language. You have that too. You have yours in your boat. And as long as we don't try to interfere in the other or uh, ask anyone to put one foot in one boat and the other foot in the other canoe, we'll get along great. Because what happens is the boats can spread apart and whoever's standing between the two will fall into the water and be lost. So it was a good metaphor, a good response to that, the first thought. And so that, even our elected chiefs today uh, sometimes take copies of this belt when they go to Ottawa or Albany or Washington and, and try to remind uh, the government today of that original agreement, this non-interference agreement, to, to preserve the cultural integrity of each other. And to this day we've held to it. Uh, we've never interfered. A lot of us don't vote. We, we don't go and vote in the outside government. Uh, kind of a real taboo to do that. We don't tell anybody, well, we really don't think Prince Charles is fit to be king. We've never seen that. Never. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't even think it. We wouldn't even think it. <laughs> He's a great guy. <laughs> now, people wonder, like, uh, you had such a great system, and um, it was perfect and wonderful. Well, what are you doing up on the St. Lawrence? If your original territory was south of the Adirondacks and on the Mohawk River, what are you doing up in the St. Lawrence? Well, there was another colony that came up the St. Lawrence, the French. And God bless the French. God bless them. They, they, were, they came in with a different motivation. The Dutch and the English were really into plantations and, and uh, basically spreading out and basically pushing the Indians to the west. The French, on the other hand, were coming in. They're fur traders. Well, there's not much farming going up there. It's kind of cold, so... They're here for the fur-bearing animals. And, and that's the other thing about our history is we're the victims of fashion because they got these beaver hats that were all the rage in Europe. Everybody had to have their beaver hat. Where are you going to get them? North America. So we're drawn into this fur trade and this basically a world war to provide furs to the, the rich people of Europe. So the victims of fashion, we are. But we're in it. We're changing. Our way of life, we're taking on European goods, uh, Indianizing it a little bit to, to, to make sure it's kind of like ours. Like this shirt, for instance. This is a colonial trade shirt, a commonly traded, but you see this even today. If you come to a traditional ceremony, you'll see our ribbon shirt. It's, it's, it's the same exact cut, the same collar, the same, everything about it is, is the same as it was 300 years ago. It's just that now it's made of different colored materials and you have fanciful ribbons sewn onto it. So these are like uh, little things that have survived the, the centuries. And, and people today, I, I mentioned where the origin of that shirt is back home, and they're like, ah, oh, you're kidding. But it's true. It's, uh, there's a lot of colonial holdovers. Um, there's other belts that relate to uh, the St. Lawrence River. One of them 
when they, the Mohawks moved up to Canada, they formed, there was a little settlement opposite Montreal called Gatnawaga. And we lived there with the Huron Indians. And they had been our ancient enemies. We used to fight them, oh, for, for the longest period of time. But under the French, we had to make peace with them and become friends with them. And so when we lived with them for a time, uh, they eventually gave us a belt. They were going to move to a new settlement down near Quebec City. And so they gave us this belt. And they, and they admonished us and said to us, uh, build a solid wooden church. Because at this time, we're uh, converts to Christianity. We're all about baby Jesus at this time. <laughs> and so they gave us this belt and said, build a solid church to de and defend everything you build against the devil because the devil will always try to destroy what you build. And so they draped this over the altar of the, the chapel in that village. And it would constantly remind them of that uh, admonishment of the Hurons. And so uh, it would, whenever they built a new church, this would be affixed above the altar. It was in the holiest of holies to our people at the time. So this was a very important belt. And it, and it actually went on to inspire uh, the creation of a new alliance. Because all these tribes that are moving to the St. Lawrence to be close to the French trade, are, uh, they're all having, uh, they're all becoming Christians, they're becoming converts, but they're also becoming allies of each other. And so they, they eventually, there were so many of these villages that they created an alliance, and they call this Jadak Milhona Wenjage, that translates to seven nations or seven lands, and uh, it's known more commonly as the seven nations of Canada. So if you look at this belt, there's a cross at the center, which would probably represent the the community of Ganawage, and there's also uh, three rectangular uh, shapes in negative space on each end, and you add those up and that brings you to seven, and it, it just happens to be that the seven nations of Canada, um, there were multiple villages, and sometimes there weren't seven, sometimes there were eight or nine, but they would always just kind of reconfigure back to that seven, because seven was uh, a very important number in the Christian world. There's, it's the seventh day when God rested after creation, so uh, also Sunday, the seventh day. It's all, you know, it's all related to uh, seven. That's a big, important numeral. It's also one more than six. The six nations, it was like a one-up of the, the old confederacy. <laughs> Because the French, they wanted when they would go to war against the English, like in the French and Indian War, they wanted to be able to say the, to the British, "Well, we're here with the Seven Nations, not six. So, this is just some of the things that we talk about with uh, Wampum. Is uh, diplomacy it has a lot to do with uh, warfare. There are peace belts. There are war belts. There are belts that relate to legends, to to uh, trade alliances. It's all there. And it's our, it's our language. We did not have a written language. But we did paint little pictographs on rocks and trees along the shores. In fact, up and down the St. Lawrence, the Great Lakes area, you're gonna, they used to, I don't know if they can still see them today. They're, they're looking for them. But you know, you see these little markers along the, the shore. What am I doing for time? I must be getting pretty close to the end. Five more minutes. OK. Um, talk, I want to talk specifically about Akwazasne now. Now, uh, Akwazasne in the modern times, uh, you go there, and in fact, if you ever hear about Akwazasne, it's usually in the newspaper. Usually there's a, uh, somebody getting caught smuggling marijuana or cigarette trade. You know, every, it seems like every week in Canada, there's some horrible condemning article about how bad the smuggling is in Akwazasne. Well, it's because we were sitting there as happy as could be, and then all of a sudden, one of George Washington's uh, officers comes along with a telescope and a bunch of mechanical devices and begins to draw lines. And they, we asked him, what are you doing? And he said, well, we're drawing a border between British territory and American territory. It won't apply to you Indians. It's eight feet high. And there'll never be an Indian taller than eight feet, so don't worry about it. <laughs> And so we said, fine, well, we can come and go as we please, and it, it seemed to be a great situation for us. But as uh, around the time of the War of 1812, 
that, that border suddenly was uh, the Berlin Wall for us. You, you had to make up your mind, are you going to be an American Indian or a Canadian Indian? And so uh, even today we still are dealing with that uh, conundrum of uh, what side are we really, or are we still our own nation? And I contend that we are uh, a nation. We, we have our own culture, our own um, identity, our own history that, is, that predates Canada and the U.S. There's no question about that. And uh, for Akwesasne in particular, it, it, it was there as a permanent settlement from 1755, long before the U.S. and Canada even existed as separate sovereign powers. So it's something that we still deal with. We're still dealing with uh, the border. I don't know if you were able to see it from the, the, the maps and photos that Jessica showed you, but there is one island, Cornwall Island, where my cultural center is located, has two bridges connecting it to the mainland. And we have just an enormous amount of problems by having customs on each opposite side of uh, the island. And just the daily aggravations of having to deal with the U.S.-Canada uh, border just to go to work, you know, the, the, the extra hour spent in transit just for me to go from my house in St. Regis Village, which is technically Quebec, I have to drive through New York State, then cross over to Cornwall Island, which is Ontario, and actually I got to drive all the way to Cornwall, Ontario, and come back because I got to check in at Customs. So, so that's a whole half hour in my morning to go home. I probably sit about a half an hour at U.S. Customs, and uh, so so this is the aggravation of the border. So is it any wonder that there's a smuggling trade going on? People in boats. They really can't fish anymore. What else are they going to do with those boats? <laughs> That's another thing I want to mention. I go off on tangents from time to time. <laughs> She mentioned there's, there's GM, Alcoa, all these industrial plants polluting the river, right? And so it's no wonder the fish are on Prozac down in Montreal. I tell you, should be on it too. She, she left out the one, the one, the major polluter of all time, the fishermen peeing off the back of their boats. Right? <laughs> Knock it off, all right? <laughs> Pull ashore, do something, carry a can in the boat. Come on, I can see you from my house. <laughs> <laughs> that, that never gets mentioned in any of the science. <laughs> Who wants to drink that stuff? I don't know. But I grew up, I'm 46 years old, I'm proud of that fact. Uh, when I was a kid, everybody had these big fishing boxes along the, along the St. Regis River and the St. Lawrence River. There were these great big boxes sitting in the water and we'd all go in there and look and see what kind of fish the local fisherman has. There were people coming in, buying fish. Uh, it was the thing. That was how we lived. And then, when I was like in my uh, early teens, these advisories went out saying, don't eat the fish. They're just loaded with pollution. And even also uh, studies of the, the, the cows and farms are uh, so polluted that their teeth were falling out. They couldn't chew grass anymore. So. In my lifetime, I've seen radical change, and uh, so now um, you don't see those fishing boxes anymore. They're, they just don't exist. I tell kids about them, and they're like, eh, "What are you talking about?" But I remember them uh, as a child, uh, playing in them, even falling in one of them once. And uh, uh, the stories about the, the the river life was amazing. Uh, one one young fellow I know, I don't even know if this is true, but I'm going to tell you. They're fishing, and, and they pull up this great big northern pike or a muskie. I'm not sure what, but it was a monster. And it was not given up. It was, they thought the boat was going to get swamped. And one of, the, one of the kids in the boat, when they got the, 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 the fish close enough to the boat, he dove out of the boat onto the fish and tried to wrestle. This is the, this is the crazy stuff that happens in Alcazar. They're going to ride this fish like a horse, apparently, and wrestle it to shore. This is the kind of crazy stuff that happens when you live on a river and you're all about fishing and that's what you do. Is Occasionally you have to wrestle a great big fish if you want to eat. Um, my grandmother, occasionally you hear stories of creatures before the seaway came in and radically altered everything. 
Uh, my grandmother was swimming in the St. Lawrence River with her friends, and they saw this creature. She thought it was a horse. She thought somebody's horse fell in the river somehow, and here it comes by. And suddenly it noticed the kids swimming, and it began to advance towards them. And then she realized it's not a fish at all. I mean, it's not a horse at all. It's some kind of monster. And so the kids just tore off out of there and never swam in the St. Lawrence again. They were so terrified of this, whatever it was, a Loch Ness monster or something. But she insisted that that was, that was really true, that really happened. And so there are other stories like that, uh, serpent stories. Um, occasionally people see some really big uh, creatures way down deep. We've got scuba divers now. One scuba diver was down there in the really deep part. They're looking for those old logs left over from the old logging days. They can pull those out and make a lot of money with them. Well, one guy was down there and he looked up above himself and he saw this big fish of some kind swimming over him, and that was the end of his scuba diving days. <laughs> so, uh, I tend to be a kind of an advocate, of the devil's advocate, you might say. Uh, I like to take a little counter approach to a lot of things. Like a lot of people, if you hear a lot of our speakers go out, they condemn the St. Lawrence Seaway as the worst thing that ever happened, as the holocaust of the modern times. Well, I like to say, just hold off just a second there. That St. Lawrence Seaway, for all the, the changes that it brought. It also regulated what was really the craziest waterway. It was, uh, for instance, uh, where I live, occasionally you would have these massive ice jams, right? Uh, just past where the Grass River and the Racket River uh, enter the St. Lawrence, you would get these massive ice jams because the water gets calm there. And upriver, you had the old uh, Long Sioux Rapids, and so you get these huge jams of ice, so much that you could take a team of horses across the ice. It was an ice bridge back then. And what that would happen, what would happen then is the Grass River would would jam up so much and it would flood. The, the water would actually go the opposite way over the dam that used to be in Messina and take out the bridges that they tried to build. So now that you have the St. Lawrence and it's regulated and all of that natural stuff doesn't occur, you're able to use the land a little bit better. So there, there has been some benefits. Now I, I, I like to throw that out there just, just to keep people aware that uh, sometimes when we go out and we really condemn the St. Lawrence Seaway Project, because it, it, it did radically alter the fishing it, it changed a lot of the, the way the, the, the fish spawned and things like that. But, and it also encouraged um, industry to come into the area, which has just been catastrophic. But there's also a few benefits to uh, having a regulated water system. We don't advocate getting rid of the, the power dam. But I'll tell you, there was a... I probably shouldn't even mention this. But I will anyway. When they built that big power dam between Cornwall and Messina, I don't know how they forgot this, but less than three miles from that dam is Messina Center. Now, Messina Center had two massive earthquakes, one in the late, late part of the 1800s and uh, one in the 1940s, which was considered the worst earthquake in New York history, was centered in Messina. And it was uh, quite a doozy. So, I don't know what kind of logic was at play in building a massive power dam three miles from uh, some epicenter of the worst New York State earthquake, but we may see some changes at some point in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing most of you have cottages like this one. <laughs> pretty soon that's all going to be gone. So, when I was a chief, I love my last little story. Uh, when I was a chief on the council, our emergency planner guy came in, and he goes, oh, this is what we do. We come up with scenarios. They're just, they're just scenarios. They're not going to happen. They're just something that we can plan with. He rolls out this great big map, and it's the St. Lawrence River as it pertains to Akwazasne. And he goes, uh, this is what we project would, it would look like if the St. Lawrence, uh, if the, the power dam ever gave way. And this is the flooding. And so we had uh, 
well, actually, Akwesasne is now just a series of islands because of the water levels. And so he's going through a scenario saying, you know, this would be our little command post. <laughs> all of these houses would be gone, these would be flooded. And so we're all looking around like, this is just a scenario, right? This is not, you don't really think this is going to happen. He's like, yeah, no, no, this is never going to happen. <laughs> don't worry about it, Chief. It's, it's, it couldn't possibly happen. I said, well, do you have any other scenarios? And he goes, no. <laughs> no earthquake, no, no, uh, you know, no floods, no natural disasters, no uh, meteors hitting. Nope, just an earthquake that takes out the power band. So, oh, I don't know. But uh, so keep an eye on the news. You know, give the ground shake. Call me up. Make sure I'm safe. Because I'm living right on that river. Anyway, uh, I want to just acknowledge. Um, uh, Elder from Akwesasne, uh, Chief Jake Swamp, who, who probably many of you have heard speak. He was the founder of the Tree of Peace Society. We lost Jake a few months ago. He had a heart attack and, and passed away unexpectedly. And uh, he's been a huge influence on me growing up. He's the one who told me the, the story of the, the creation story. The first time I ever heard it was from Jake. Another elder that we had was uh, Ernest Benedict, who is, uh, I think, 92 years old, and he just passed away about a month ago. He was the founder of the cultural center where I worked, and uh, probably the first Akwesasne to get a college degree back in the 1940s, I think. It started our, our uh, newspaper. Oh, just an incredible man. Um, my elder brother, Brad, passed away last summer. Uh, some of you may have heard him speaking around New York State. And he was a well-known artist and also an iron worker who worked on the, the cleanup of the World Trade Center. And so if you uh, go down to the State Museum, you, he's, I think, uh, got some kind of part in the World, the World Trade Center exhibit down there. And so he also passed away recently. So these are three icons from my life growing up that I want to acknowledge at this time and uh, have a big part in the fact that I'm even doing this, getting up and talking in front of people and sharing a little bit of uh, our cultural history with you. So that brings me to the end. Uh, if any of you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So thank you very much. Were the Mashpee Indians your source of the Quahog, and are the Mashpees part of your uh, affiliation or organization? Well, not really. Um, the the tribes that lived on the coast and the, the Narragansetts, the Pequots, and I, I can't even name all the ones that were involved in manufacturing. Um, eventually, the Dutch realized how how valuable wampum was. And they began to open their own factories to manufacture the beads. In fact, the, most of the belts that you see in museums, uh, the beads are manufactured by these uh, uh, colonial wampum factories. And uh, so that's another little known fact is that the Europeans began to make it themselves. And so uh, actually they became a middleman. Uh, we actually didn't have all that much contact with those coastal tribes. In fact, actually, we used to go out and make war upon some of those people. And they, they remind us of that when we meet them. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? All right. Well, I guess we're getting up to lunchtime, so uh, I want to thank you for inviting me to come and talk to you. Thank you very much. so much again, Darren. Appreciated that presentation. Um, so a couple just logistics before we break for lunch. I know you're all getting hungry. 